just take this opportunity to remind members of the COVID-related me measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus. The next item of business is a debate on motion 3281 in the name of Sandesh Gulhani on preventing the collapse of NHS dentistry in Scotland. And I would invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons or put R in the chat function. And I call on Sandesh Gulhani to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, presiding officer. We're here today to have a frank debate on the state of the NHS dentistry in Scotland in 2022. For sure, COVID-19 has hit dentistry hard, with practices closed during the early months of the pandemic. Once services resumed, infection control measures continue to limit the number of patients that dentists can see in a given hour. These are indeed serious obstacles, which I'll cover more later. But we should also recognise that for over a decade, since well before the pandemic, the Scottish Government's model for engaging with dentists has been flawed. They are wedded to the old system. There's a lack of focus on prevention, with some regulations even based on outdated practice. Over the years, there's been little appetite by the Scottish Government to reform. In fact, and this is exactly and typical of how the Scottish Government work, they gave practices and the BDA one working day's notice before introducing free dentistry to those under 26. As things stand, it's bleak. The British Dental Association surveyed its members and found a third intend to leave the profession during the next 12 months. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. We, would you recognise that actually uh, removing and abolishing dental charges was in the SNP's manifesto? We had a whole section on dentistry. Why did he only have one mention of dentistry in his manifesto? Sandesh Gohani. I think, uh, I think the Cabinet Secretary needs to think about how businesses work. One working day's notice is absolutely not enough to allow them to work. There is indeed a risk of an exodus from the workforce with families losing access to local NHS dentistry altogether, which will hit hardest those in the most deprived communities. We must send a clear message to dental practices and patients that this Parliament is serious about tackling a colossal backlog of unmet treatment, and that we have clear ideas to ensure a future for NHS dentistry in Scotland for the benefit of the Scottish people. With dentists having to ventilate rooms for at least 10 minutes between appointments, which they are not paid for, their hourly rate has reduced considerably. To help, the Scottish Government committed £5 million for ventilation improvements. But if you read the small print, this support is limited to £1,500 per surgery. And dentists say that significant improvements to increase patient flow would cost at least six times that amount. But the Scottish Government are patting themselves on the back. Given the issues with schools, I can't help wonder what ventilation measures the government had in mind. The cost of everything is going up. Disposables, utility bills, dental laboratory fees. So, the Scottish Government may wish to speak about record high support, investment incentives in NHS dentistry, but is this spending effective? Is it actually solving anything? If you listen to the professionals who are actually delivering dental care, or the government's own stats, no. Over 3.5 million NHS dental appointments were lost during 2021, and this backlog will continue to grow unless the Scottish Government listens and opens to some fresh thinking. Patients are suffering. Families are not able to see their dentists. Kids are going without checkups. We have twice the rate of oral cancer here in Scotland as the rest of the UK. This has remained silent for too long. Two years ago, at the start of the pandemic, the Scottish Government came up with an emergency funding package for NHS dentistry. It was a typical knee-jerk reaction, which, according to dental professionals, was not fit for purpose. But, but, it was a start. What's bitterly disappointing is that two years later, there's not an interim package on offer that could pave the way for a longer-term solution. Patients need holistic oral health care. It's been known for years, of course, Minister. If, the, if the member believes that the emergency package that was brought in two years ago to support the dental sector throughout the pandemic is so flawed, why is he asking for it to be continued? Yeah, for the next Sandesh Gohani. I will come on to great detail of why, but essentially, but essentially, but it's, I'm telling you if you would care to listen, but essentially it's because it, the, we need a root and branch reform of what's going on, that we are not in a position where we're able to continue because NHS dentistry will be lost. 
It's, it's been known for years that in many ways the current dental treatment and remuneration package is frankly ridiculous. And I will go on to explain why. Let's consider cobalt chrome dentures. If you take the lab bill appointment times, dentists working for less than a minimum wage. Then there's extractions. To take out teeth, maybe to prepare a teenager for braces, dentists are only paid for the first three extractions. There's more. The price code for composite white fillings on back teeth for children have no relation to what is required in terms of time or complexity. Taking overheads into account, dentists can make a loss. In Scotland, dentists are not allowed to place a white filling on the biting surface of a back tooth, only metal. So patients either pay or they are disadvantaged with a mouthful of metal. Yet a white filling can be offered in England and Wales. There seems to be no reason for this other than the government's regulations are out of date. We're seeing lower patient participation in our most deprived areas. Oral health inequalities will translate into long-term higher disease burden as the chances of picking up early signs of decay and oral cancers at routine checkups are reduced. Also, delays in treatment will mean higher costs to NHS and worse outcomes for patients. NHS dentistry in Scotland was in crisis before COVID hit. As we come out of the pandemic, we know millions of our fellow Scots have missed out on important oral health checks. We also know that dentists are exhausted, demoralised, and many are looking for the exit to either change careers, take on more private work, or go overseas where demand is high and remuneration is fairer. Dentists and their staff are being abused by frustrated patients because of how long they have to wait. People think dentists are rich. It's worth noting that between 2009 and 2019, taxable income of dentists in Scotland eroded by 35%. The Scottish Government has failed to grasp that NHS dentistry needs to be adequately funded and retain a skilled workforce that includes dental nurses, technicians and support staff. If we don't help the profession, we risk losing NHS dentistry forever. The Scottish Conservatives want NHS dentistry to succeed, and that's why we're calling on emergency funding to remain as an interim solution, is as an interim solution, whilst you discuss with the British Dental Association a root and branch change. And we believe that we also need a 30% increase in tariffs as an interim measure. We need to ensure dentistry is financially viable based on delivering holistic, modern, best practice services and on prevention rather than fee per item and drill and fill culture. Finally, by supporting our dentists and their practice, they have a fighting chance to work through the backlog and the goal to offer every Scot a dental checkup in 2022 and stay on track in accordance with clinical guidance thereafter. I move the name in my amendment and we will support the Labour amendment. Thank you. I now call on Marie Todd to speak to and move amendment 3281.2. Up to six minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, and thank you, Sandra Scalhani, for raising the important matter of patient access to NHS dental care. The dental sector, as we all know, has been disproportionately impacted by the nature of the pandemic. And in order to protect patients and staff, dental practices are required to operate with specific infection prevention and control measures, including a fallow time between patients and full PPE protection. During the initial lockdown in March 2020, dental practices were closed to face-to-face -face patient care and NHS board centres largely focused on emergency and urgent dental care. Since that initial phase of lockdown, dental practices have slowly remobilised, offering increasing levels of care to their patients. While registration levels remain comparable with before the pandemic, those patients attending a dentist in the last two years has fallen from around 70% to 53%, and that is entirely due to the impact of the pandemic, which is why the Scottish Government has supported the NHS dental sector throughout the pandemic with an additional £50 million pounds of financial support payments. Yes, certainly. Finlay Carson. Thank you for taking the intervention. Can I ask what assessment uh, the Minister or the Government has made of the impact of the decision to remove the financial top-up support from the 1st of April for NHS dentistry? Minister. So I'll, I'll go on to explain where we, we, what we've done is very carefully uh, avoid a cliff edge. We're not simply removing that, we're replacing it with a, a system that rewards activity because we are aware that what we need to do is get more patients seen by dentists. So. 
we, we have given an additional 50 million of financial support patient pay, payments, but we've also provided specific funding to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on dental activity. And that includes seven and a half million funding for new dental drills, five million for ventilation improvements, 35 million of NHS PPE to date. The Scottish Government is determined to ensure NHS dental services emerge well placed to care for the oral health of the whole population. We've also committed, certainly, yeah, Stephen Kerr. On the basis, on the basis of the statement. I apologise. On the basis of the statement the Minister just made, what does the Minister say to the British Dental Association who say that her government's approach to dentistry in Scotland could spell the end of NHS dentistry in Scotland? Minister. So this government is unashamedly putting patients first in our thinking about how the dental services are delivered in Scotland. And in order to ensure that the people of Scotland have access to NHS dentistry free at the point of need, we are working really hard to support the dental sector. I'd be interested to hear from any intervening Conservatives whether they actually support that commitment to NHS dentistry being free at the point of need. We've committed to tackling... OK, Dr Gohani. Thank you. It's, it's interesting because um, there's a total lack of a financial package and I wonder if the Minister has simply outlined right there a new, a new support measure coming in April and how she continues to fund. But NHS dentistry does need to be free at the point of care, but we need to have a financial package to actually have that, which you have not said. Minister. So I'm very pleased to hear that commitment from my Conservative colleagues. Absolutely wonderful to have cross-party support for free NHS dental care for everyone in Scotland. Absolutely delighted. Let me continue. Let me continue and set out the financial package that we have put in place in order to support that. We have committed to tackling the backlog in care. We have announced an additional 20 million of increased fees this month to help see them through more face-to-face -face, um, patients, including those from our most deprived communities. I've let you intervene twice, Mr. Gulhani. Please, will you allow me to proceed and set out what financial support we are giving to our dentists? This funding announcement is part of a 9% increase in the overall budget for NHS dental services in 2022-23 to support a return to more normal levels of activity. Now, the additional money will deliver enhanced examinations for everyone, children and adults. Children are a key focus as we recover NHS dental care. We've taken steps to expand the funding of the Child Smile programme in dental practices, increasing it up to 17 years of age. The Scottish Government absolutely recognises the need to address oral health inequalities arising from the pandemic. And we're making those additional Child Smile interventions of £2 million over two years from April 22 to support the distribution of additional toothbrushing packs and recruitment of dental health support workers. These initiatives will focus on families and children living in areas of disadvantage, especially those from minority ethnic backgrounds. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence guidelines state that recall intervals for parent, patients who have repeatedly demonstrated that they can maintain oral health who are not considered to be at risk or, or, of or from oral disease might be extended over time to an interval of 24 months. Looking forward, our vision for NHS dental services is to ensure that all persons with the same clinical needs should be treated in the same way and that special attention is paid to actions that might further disadvantage the already disadvantaged and vulnerable. As part of that, we'll engage the sector in suitable reforms that allow dentists to practice modern dentistry, including the introduction of an oral risk health assessment. Minister, could you please care. conclude? Okay, um, I will. There, there are a number of vitally important processes that we are putting in place. What we must do is link financial support to dentistry, to seeing patients. We must reward NHS dental teams for improving patient access. Minister, I must stop you there. The focus needs to be 
on recovering M Minister, the could I, Minister, could I just ask you to move the amendment? I move the amendment. Thank you. I now call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move Amendment 3281.1. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Now, I never thought I would stand here and say that the very existence of NHS dentistry in Scotland is currently under threat. So the government's complacency in light of this is genuinely deeply concerning because NHS dentistry is in crisis. From the millions of lost appointments to the struggle to see an NHS dentist, plummeting staff morale and widening social inequalities. It is clear that urgent action is needed to pull our NHS dentist services back from the brink. Almost half of people in Scotland have been unable to see an NHS dentist for the last two years. And yes, I know we have had a pandemic, but the path to recovery is far from clear. Figures from Public Health Scotland show the number of treatments up to March 2021 was down by something like 75%. That equates to as many as 3.5 million appointments having been lost. That is a backlog that will take years to clear. Measures imposed on dentists by the government due to the pandemic has meant that the number of patients that NHS dentists are able to see is still severely limited. The British Dental Association has told us that despite the best efforts of dentists, returning to business as usual is still a distant prospect. It is important to note that these restrictions did not apply to private dental treatment, a surprising omission by the SNP government. No wonder so many people were turning to private dental care, because the government have left them with no choice to get the essential care that they needed. And the consequences of this are likely to be profound. What we are effectively seeing is the backdoor privatisation of the Scottish dental sector. And it is not as simple as lifting the restrictions and everything will be fine, because 80% of Scottish dentists are planning to reduce their NHS commitment if the government reverts to pre-pandemic arrangements. I will in a second. Let me translate that for the government, because reducing NHS commitments means doing the same work, but in a private setting. And this will simply deepen inequalities. Only yesterday, I'm, I'm very conscious of time, I do apologise to the people who want to intervene, but only yesterday I was contacted by a woman who raised the issue of appointment deposits. This was new to me because to attend her free NHS checkup and receive a £13 basic dental clean, she is being charged a £20 deposit. At a time when the cost of living is skyrocketing, many families cannot afford to part with £20 especially for an appointment that should be routine. Let me turn to inequality. Public Health Scotland tell us that less than half of adults from the most deprived areas have seen an NHS dentist over the last two years. For the wealthiest areas, it is well over half. And these inequalities are only starker when it comes to children's dental care, with only 55% of children from the most deprived areas being seen by a dentist in the last two years, but it's 20% higher for those from the least deprived areas. It was, of course, Scottish Labour that introduced Child Smile. We did this to tackle inequalities in oral health and to ensure access to dental services for every child in Scotland, regardless of back background. And I am pleased that the Scottish Government have continued it. It is, however, depressing that the considerable progress made in child dental health is now going backwards. This, coupled with the fact that those from poorer backgrounds are less likely to have received treatment, is nothing short of a national disgrace. Dental care, under the SNP's watch, is fast becoming the privilege of the few who can afford to go private. That is why Scottish Labour's amendment calls for action to avoid a two-tier dental system. It is essential that emergency funding for dentists doesn't stop at the end of March, I don't understand how any government could look at the current state of NHS dentistry and deem now to be an appropriate time to end support. And, you know, whilst I note the list of money that the Minister has outlined, and I welcome it, it isn't just a case of more money. It is the current model of funding for dental services that needs to change. The current model is about as old as the NHS itself. That's older than me. It's no longer fit for purpose, a fact recognised by the Chief Dental Officer. The current fee per item model is not sustainable. It relies on high volume turnover 
does not reflect the need to prioritise prevention or give dentists the time to care. It is not a question of more examinations. It is a question of better outcomes. But the government should really listen. Listen to the Scottish Dental Association. Listen to the British Dental Association on this point. Consultation on changes were promised two years ago. They were promised again last year, but nothing has happened. Please stop promising to consult and actually do it. And do it before you stop support of NHS dentistry or it will fall off a cliff edge and end up being privatised. And that will happen on the SNP's watch. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I call Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm very grateful to Dr Gilhani for securing time for this important matter in Parliament today. As we know, it's estimated that around 5 million people are registered with an NHS dentist here in Scotland, which represents 95% of our population. We should all be able to expect checkups, treatment and assistance uh, wherever and whenever we may need it. It should be universal, regardless of where we live or what we can afford. It is the corner, that is the cornerstone of our healthcare system, of which dentistry is, of course, as we have heard this afternoon, a key service. However, of late, that reality is diminishing. I know I'm not alone in this chamber when I say that I have had many, many constituents contact me with being unable to access basic NHS dental services, with some having to wait months for so-called emergency appointments. And as Jackie Bailey rightly just raises the spectre, the new spectre of deposits for appointments. This is not surprising if you look at the data from last summer, which revealed residents across Lothian waiting up to six months for routine dental care alone. Of course I will. Minister. It's fairly clear that that practice of deposits in advance of NHS appointments is not allowed, and we have asked um, in the private dental practices to follow NHS rules by Health Care Improvement Scotland. Alex Hamilton. Well, I'm very grateful that the Minister and the Government are taking that seriously. People have especially got in touch about being unable to arrange appointments for their children. Many children across Scotland have not had a checkup in years. Of course, that's in part down to the pandemic, but it's also about availability. It's particularly worrying that children will not receive attention during such an important growth period in their lives when expert eyes are needed the most. Um, this was the government which used child dental health uh, as a tool and as a metric for poverty when it first came to power in the national indicators. Instead of being provided with the care they deserve, Scottish patients are instead being told to look for private care, with this being simply out of the question for so many families. Yet another barrier is being placed before those who are struggling with the cost of living the most. According to the most recent data, only 55% of children were able to get an appointment from the most deprived areas of Scotland, compared to 73% in the least deprived areas of our country. This is a health inequality. Dentists in Scotland have warned us that such disparity will contribute towards a healthcare inequality gap in which disease and long-term problems will become more and more commonplace amongst the most disadvantaged. Presiding officer, this simply does not cut it. It's not just about dental checkups. Mouth cancer can be missed from these important screening appointments. There are many groups I'm, I'm afraid I don't have time. I must make progress, Mr Doris. There are many groups across society that need our attention regarding this issue. It was only on Monday that I spoke to a constituent who is also a veteran. He told me of the huge lack of coordination across services meant that veterans routinely struggle to access dental care on leaving the armed services. This needs to be noted in any changes in providing services going forward. And it's not only our patients that are struggling, but our dentists too, who are also under enormous pressure. Scottish dentist uh, Dr Douglas Thane said recently that dentists have been repeatedly asked to provide, and I quote, a fine dining experience with McDonald's-like resources. This is leaving dentists having to sacrifice their own welfare for the sake of providing basic services they should be given uh, the resources to deliver. This is sadly another example of those who work in healthcare being burdened with poor mental health as a result of the job they chose to do. That is why my party's burnout plan to provide mental health services to dentists and other healthcare practitioners and all NHS staff is still so important. Not only does the current situation situation put inordinate strain on our dentists, but it also causes a much deeper problem. Dentists within the NHS are being handed a severe lack of funding and slashed unit prices, which has been combined with an increased demand 
for dental services. It is a perfect storm. And I can see you want me to close, presiding officer. So, so I'll finish by saying our dentistry system needs to be accessible to everyone, whether they need it or uh, a radical overhaul is needed. That is why Scottish Liberal Democrats will be supporting Dr Gilhani's motion today. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, presiding officer. They often say that life is short and you should smile while you still have teeth. Well, sadly, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people right across Scotland unless dramatic action is taken to start tackling the enormous dental backlogs that are growing longer day by day. Tragically, one of the most serious legacies of the 15 years of this government's failure, and there are plenty, is the worrying rise in dental inequalities, none more so than within rural and deprived communities across Scotland that have already been the hardest hit during the last few years of COVID, with fewer than half of adults being able to see their dentists. Perhaps even more alarmingly, only 55% of children were able to do likewise. And to add further to this bleak outlook, dentists have already warned of a max exodus within this health sector that will leave many people with little or no access to dental care unless new funding and measures are urgently put in place. The, dental, uh, the British Dental Association have already revealed that four in five dentists will reduce their NHS commitment, leaving huge numbers of NHS patients with a stark dilemma. Either go private or simply don't go at all. In many cases, there's no other option. Just bite the bullet, if excuse the pun. Having to pay into an expensive dental plan at a time when most households can ill afford to taking on extra expenses. Uh, or watch your smile disappear. That's the, the options. So, like a great many of you, I'm sure my correspondence on dentistry issues has grown dramatically in, in recent weeks. Uh, one constituent in Sunrara, my Gallo and West and Freeze constituency, told me of the plight facing her children accessing dental treatment and care. She said that there, she was always of the opinion that all children got dental view and treatment free of charge within Scotland. However, this is no longer the case, she informed me. The majority of dentists in the region now refuse to take any children onto their lists unless their patients, their parents register privately and pay into an expensive monthly insurance scheme. There are a few exceptions, but there is one Dumfries, a dentist in Dumfries who was still accepting NHS patients, but that would involve her on a 150-mile round trip. Most dental practices state that they are full and unable to take on children, yet if she paid, all of a sudden they can be seen. This discriminates against those from a less well-off background where parents can't afford the schemes. Another constituent informed me their children registered with a new dentist last October. An appointment was scheduled for January but cancelled. However, if she paid for them to go privately, then she'd be, they could be taken straight away. And, she quote, and I quote, If I was able to pay private, I would go, but with a grown family and increasing living costs, there's no way I can afford it. But I feel this is the way things are being forced. And I'm also reliably informed that not one dentist in Sonar is now taking on new NHS patients. And it begs the question, how many people are expected to afford private dentistry, even if you can find one? And in Castle Douglas, uh, there is another dentist not taking NHS patients, again leaving many families struggling to make arrangements. It is little wonder then that the number of children registered with an NHS dentist is declining in my region, a situation that must surely be addressed as a matter of urgency. And the warm words for the Minister will be of little comfort to my constituents in Stranraer, whose children have no access to NHS dentists other than having to travel for 150 miles. Can you imagine the outcry if you're asking patients in Edinburgh or Glasgow to travel to Dundee to see their dentist? Yeah. This, this government think, they think that an indicator of success is simply crowing about more equipment or increased fun, funding and fail repeatedly to recognise that the indicator for success right across the health sector is better outcomes for patients. This SNP government has given us very little reason to be happy, but I urge the Cabinet Secretary urgently move to address this growing crisis and find the necessary resources that will at least let our children smile. Thank you. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I want to register my thanks to all in the medical services, but focusing this debate on dentists for endeavouring to deliver essential services in these unique and difficult two years, which are still continuing. It is obvious that dentistry in particular, with its necessary use of aerosol procedures, let alone the intimacy of dental contact with patients and the design of their facilities, would find it particularly difficult to tend to their patients. People, too, would be avoiding treatment for fear of COVID. 
The backlog was therefore, as in other areas and not confined to the health service, unavoidable, though none of us could predict how far it would go. But the pace is picking up now in delivery of services. Our concern and our understanding of why we're here now should be agreed. However, the hyperbolic nature of the uh, Conservative motion reminds me more of Dad's army. We're all doomed. We're all doomed. God bless Private Fraser. I have four minutes. No, oh, I'll take the intervention if you're going to say something interesting to me, Mr Gulhani. Would, uh, would, would the member agree that the financial package announced just now by Minister Todd clearly does not allow free dentistry for all, as she said it would? Christine Green. This is, this is a path we're taking. It's not tomorrow. That is obvious from what the, what the, the minister said. But uh, your headline news, it's very good for the tabloids, preventing the collapse of NH dentistry in Scotland. What a headline. But also, I'll come to this in a minute, an interesting point that Mr Gulhani made. Although additionally dentists received, along with other medical professions, a 3% pay rise last year in, for recognition of their efforts during the pandemic and in line with the recommendation of the independent UK review body of doctors and dentist remuneration, Mr Gulhani reminded us this is not a criticism of dentists, but a fact that they are businesses. They are not services. They are in contract to the NHS, and there is a conflict. There is a conflict. They are businesses, just as many GP practices are. You use the term, Mr. Mr. Gilhani. You use Ms. the term, Mr. Gilhani. I beg your pardon. The member used the term. They are businesses. And that is what I'm reflecting on. It's not a criticism. It's we have this hybrid situation where the NHS is contracted to provide services to professionals who also have to make profits to take in partners to run businesses. There's the same conflict in GP practices. And that's something we must be frank about and address. Now, what the minister has already addressed is if you add together everything the minister said in her statement, at the beginning, 112.5 million of public funding has already gone out to dentists. And in reference to what the member said about Dumfries and Gallo in his constituency, where the provision of dentists is insufficient, as of the 7th of, 7th of February this month, for example, in Chelsea and Berks, are not my patch, but in the borders, and in parts of Dumfries and Galloway, and subject to certain criteria to recruit and retain there's an offer over, of 25,000 over two years to dentists to go into these areas where there's a difficulty in retention, which I accept there is, but the government is trying, endeavouring to do it. You see, in the real world that I live in, we have fixed budgets. And every time I hear from there and from there calls for funding, I say to myself, where is your money tree that I don't have in my back garden and the government doesn't have in its? So if you, if you collectively want these things, say where the money is coming from and have it in the budget. Thank you. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Carol Mockin. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. And I am pleased to be speaking in this debate. And I have to say, uh, I was thinking back to debates that we've had in this chamber on this particular topic. And there's always been inequality in, in dental care as in, in other healthcare sectors. There are those who never get access to good oral hy uh, hygiene and care. And I remember being shocked at the number of children who don't even have a toothbrush, let alone understand uh, good oral hygiene. The number of parents who don't know how to teach their children to brush their teeth. And the steady increase in children having to have extractions, especially in the lower SIMD areas. A dentist friend of mine used to give me hundreds of toothbrushes and, 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 and tubes of toothpaste to give out to a couple of third sector organisations in Ayrshire, like Yip World and Centre Stage, who had taken it upon themselves to help with good oral hygiene with parents and young service users. This growing uh, health inequality has only been significantly exacerbated during COVID. I do think that when we discuss health and health inequalities, we, do tend, we, do, we tend not to think of dentistry and access to treatment as much as we should. My dentist friend says that demands just now are, are, are like nothing he has ever seen. More and more people are seeking private dentists because they cannot get access to NHS dentists. They are struggling to keep up, keep up with far longer waiting lists than there have ever been. And this is not good for swift care free at the point of need. 
Increasingly, there is frustration from patients uh, on the waiting times, as, as my colleague Sandish Gohari said, and this is being passed on to dentists. Inevitably, this is driving that health inequality that I mentioned at the start of my contribution, because, of course, there are those who just cannot contemplate paying for their dentist. And I did listen with interest in the Minister's contribution, and quite frankly, I think any dentist listening to her cannot help but be worried, because if that is the representative of the Scottish Government's understanding of the crisis in our dental surgeries, then their head is buried so far in the sand, all we can see is the soles of their feet. I did say to, to uh, my dentist friend that I would highlight uh, a couple of points that he wanted to make, and that is growing tension in waiting rooms. Uh, Mask-exempt patients are accusing their dentists of inequality, feeling they have the right to use the waiting rooms, causing difficult encounters. Vulnerable people are struggling as they want dental care, but are fearful of the risk of exposure to COVID, i.e. sitting in waiting rooms. Mask-wearing uh, wearing rules in healthcare settings and waiting rooms, he said, should continue regardless of rule changes elsewhere to protect patients who remain or feel at risk. So vulnerable and at-risk patients have the right to access health care and feel safe. And I recognise this flies in the face of the direction of travel that, that, that we're going in, but there are those who are vulnerable whose needs should be considered as we hopefully come out of the other side of this pandemic. So perhaps there are situations that we need to consider where special cases can be made to ensure equal access to health care. I think that, that is a right after all. He did say that it's harder to keep staff. The level of PPE has worked as he is not aware of any patient to dentist infection. This is great news, but it's really difficult to wear. Training a nurse, he said, for three months uh, and has now handed in her notice as they're struggling to wear gear. There's a notable, noticeable increase in headaches and he suspects this is due to PPE. Now, he does say that this, the PPE needs to continue, but we need to acknowledge to, and recognise that dentistry now is really, really struggling. As my colleague Sandesh Gohani said uh, in his contribution, uh, there is an increasing backlog. There are concerns from the profession that the, the current settlement uh, 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 rising, uh, uh, is, going to, uh, 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 sorry, is going to prevent a financially viable sector. The Scottish Government need to recognise that the pressures on HS dentistry not only is driving patients towards the private sector, it is driving dentists towards the private sector. It is absolutely crucial, therefore, if the Scottish Government truly wants to tackle the significant and growing health inequalities that exist in access to dental treatment, they make the NHS dentist, dentistry as viable as it can possibly be and conclude, create that Whittle. system that encourages careers in NHS dentistry. The Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Carol Mockham to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is, and in fact, I think we will leave here today having made it absolutely clear that there is a serious crisis in dentistry. And it is a crisis caused by government indecision and ineffectiveness. We all know and agree here in this chamber the cost of living is a constant source of concern in our communities at the moment. However, also of concern is the anxiety and stress caused by uncertainty around health. And for many people, that includes their own, for their own and their loved ones' oral health. Many parents have expressed to me the ongoing worrying, worry of accessing a local NHS dentist for their children, and this is simply unacceptable. Of course, COVID is a serious co contributing factor to this issue, uh, currently facing dentistry, but we cannot always frame everything in this context. Presiding officer, oh, presiding officer, there were very many concerns and problems around uh, in the pressures on dentistry and dental surgeries and the availability of appointments before COVID. And the truth is, if something is not done, the same problems will be around a lot longer than this episode. This is the stark reality that we face. Dentistry is one of the issues I hear the most complaints about when speaking to constituents, yet it rarely receives the attention other forms of healthcare get. Any assessment of the Scottish Government's stewardship over more than a decade would be far from positive. The record on delivering positive healthcare outcomes for the people of this country in dentistry and beyond is poor, and they cannot get away with this any longer. In fact, it often seems that when it comes to dentistry, we have an implied belief that it is truly is a secondary concern, 
and that really, if you're particularly concerned, you should simply go private. Because this Scottish Government does not have the solutions, not at the moment, thank you, to the significant problems we face. We have heard this in the Chamber today. Presiding officer, this is not good enough. There are thousands of people in Scotland who would have to choose between paying for such procedures and simply persevering, often in pain. We have all heard these stories, and it is not a thing of the past, as we might think. And sadly, presiding officer, I return to an issue I raise in this chamber almost every day I attend, inequality. As the Scottish Labour Amendment notes, thousands of Scots in the most deprived areas of our country have not seen a dentist in over two years. And only 55% of the poorest young people have been able to see a dentist, compared to some 73% from wealthier areas. That is a deficit that will increase mortality later in life, and we have to address it now. It is simply unacceptable. The worst off in our society are being left open to serious decay and loss of teeth, and in some cases, unidentified mouth cancers. That is not simply cosmetic. It is absolutely fundamental. In essence, presiding officer, we are being left with a two-tier dental system in which those with the ability to pay their way out of problems maintain their own health, while those with no means to do so are exposed to greater risk. Is that the legacy this government wants to leave? It is certainly something that these benches will fight against. As my colleagues have noted, the SNP administration is presiding over the near collapse of NHS dentistry. And it is near collapse of NHS dentistry, with over 3.5 million NHS dental appointments lost in Scotland since the first lockdown. Why then, amidst all of this, is the Cabinet Secretary for Health announcing that the additional funding which was given to dental practices during the pandemic is to Please be removed conclude, at Malkin. the end of this financial year? Is this an inappropriate time? This is a serious health crisis, and this government must change direction. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Presiding Officer, uh, I am pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate, and I will try my best to, believe it or not, make a consensual speech, because when you cut the hyperbole out of it, there is a lot to agree on, but there is also a lot of hyperbole, let us be honest. Can I first of all say we all commend the work of all those in dental practices during the pandemic in the most difficult and challenging of circumstances. And we all agree there is a need to work with dentists and dental practices to financially support them as much as possible as we emerge from COVID-19, including the need for reforms. Reforms which the Health Secretary indicated was actually in the SNP manifesto. The existence of a backlog is clear. No one has denied that. And there are undoubted pressures, again, no one has denied that. There is consensus. What is not acknowledged in the Conservative motion is the significant and meaningful investment that has been from the Scottish Government to tackle some of these challenges. And I will put them on the record again. Indeed, an additional £20 million announced only this month alone for fee and four minutes. I'm sorry, Mr. Gilhani, I cannot do that for fee enhancements. As the Scottish Government also makes clear, there's been £5 million for ventilation, £7.5 million for dental drills. £35 million for PPE and £50 million more generally for wider financial support, a 9 per cent increase in the coming financial year. That is simply factual. However, the most important aspect is actually in the Government amendment that there are ongoing and active discussions between the Scottish Government and the British Dental Association. That is the most important thing to say here this afternoon, not the hyperbole. And I thank the British Dental Association for their challenging briefing ahead of this afternoon's debate. And I also welcome local dentists who have contacted me raising their concerns about financial challenges. And I, in turn, have raised them with the Scottish Government. And the Chief Dental Officer has confirmed to me that discussions are indeed ongoing with the sector to prioritise and maximise patient care as we move through to recovery. And I am confident that the Scottish Government and the British Dental Association will find a constructive and a long-term solution. But the concerns raised with me were cash-related, but there were wider concerns, and I want to some of those on the record as well. They wanted more emphasis to be placed on preventative care, something the Scottish Government wants to see. Indeed, the £2 million mentioned here today by the Scottish Government for Child Smile 
is part of that, as is talk of the oral risk health assessments to prioritise those most need to see a dentist. So work ongoing. I would also mention that in recent years, those similar discussions have happened with Community Pharmacy Scotland to move away from a model of community pharmacy that moves away from a funding the prescribing of medicines for people are unwell to funding positive health messages in communities and direct intervention in communities to promote positive health. And there's a lesson there for dentistry, perhaps, with the community pharmacy model, and I would like to mention that. Dentists also mentioned concerns in relation to bureaucracy and recompense for uh, funding for emergency care, uh, as well as recompense for clinical administration that they didn't feel was adequately considered. So there are challenges that go beyond not just the money in the system, but how that money is used in the system. And there seems to be a consensus about inequalities in the system and how, it's, how we use the money already in the system to address those inequalities. If the conclusions we reach as a parliament is that the quantum of cash has to be focused away from some areas where dental health is very positive to other areas where it is not so, then all members in this parliament have to be part of that agenda to redirect money from some areas of the country to some communities to others in order to tackle dental health inequalities. And perhaps we can come together as a parliament to face that. And I'll be supporting the government amendment this afternoon. Thank you. I call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the beginning of the pandemic, dentists had to quickly adapt to new ways of working. They were forced to close during the early months of the pandemic and then drastically reduce the services they could offer due to the risk of COVID transmission during aerosol-generating procedures. This has been an extremely challenging period for dentistry and the huge backlog of care that has built up during the past two years means that it will remain challenging for some time. Dentists continue to operate considerably below pre-COVID levels due to infection prevention and control measures, which mean longer waiting times. As we recover from COVID, it is right that people who are, who are at higher risk are prioritised and that the frequency of dental appointments is based on clinical need. We need to trust dentists to make those assessments as they are the experts. But we currently have a system of those who can afford to pay can access dental care more quickly. This inequality cannot continue or, as others have said, we will see a two-tier two system established in Scotland. Dentists have a vital role to play in prevention and early detection of illnesses such as oral cancer. It is one of the best examples of how preventative health care can make a difference to lives. But this is undermined when patients cannot see dentists regularly. Figures published by Public Health Scotland last month revealed a sharp fall in the number of patients attending an NHS dentist, as well as a widening gap in attendance between the most and least deprived areas. In Scotland, we have lifetime registration, which the Greens fully support, but we need people to actually go to the dentist, and the pandemic will certainly have discouraged some people who may be less likely to attend. Others will have fallen out of the habit of going. Oral health inequalities existed before the pandemic and are continuing to widen, with data showing record gaps in partic participation rates. In 2008, the gap between the child participation rates for the most and least deprived areas was only three percentage points, but by September 21, this had increased to 18 percentage points. Every effort must be made to re-engage people with services, particularly those who are most at risk of developing tooth decay or other health conditions like oral cancer. And I would be keen to hear from the Cabinet Secretary what strategies could be used to reach those people who have fallen out of contact with dental services. As I have said, dentists have an important role to play in the detection of oral cancer. Since the early 1970s, oral cancer rates have been increasing and rates are significantly higher in Scotland than the UK average. According to the BDA Scotland, it remains unclear how the pandemic has impacted this. Deprivation is a risk factor for oral cancer and this underlines how important it is that we improve participation rates in deprived areas. Given the difficulties around access to dentistry caused by the pandemic, it is more important than ever that everyone is aware of the symptoms of oral cancer, which include red or white patches on the lining of your mouth or tongue, ulcers that do not heal, or a lump in your neck. Your risk is also increased if you are a heavy smoker or drinker, and I would encourage anyone who has concerning symptoms to seek medical advice. I would like to conclude with a few words on the future of dental charges. 
The Scottish Greens believe that dentistry, like other parts of the NHS, should be free at the point of need. Access to I'm in my last minute, so I need to conclude. I'm sorry. Access to health care should never be dependent on someone's ability to pay. We fully support the government's intention to remove all dental charges to patients by the end of this Parliament. But in order for patients to feel the full benefit of this, issues around access must be addressed and the backlog of care must be worked through. This will be no small undertaking and the dental profession must be supported. The BDA Scotland has expressed concern about a lack of communication regarding the decision to extend free NHS dental care to 18 to 25 year olds. And I would be grateful to hear from the Cabinet Secretary about the Government's plans to engage with the dental profession while we move towards the removal of dental charges entirely. Thank you. And I now call Evelyn Tweed, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And firstly, sorry that I cannot be in the Chamber today for this important debate. Can I begin by thanking Dr Gohani for giving us the opportunity to compare and contrast dentistry services in Scotland with England and the attitude of the SNP with that of the Conservative Party. Let's not forget the impact of the pandemic on dental services, which is not unique to Scotland. I'd like to thank dentists and their staff for their service during these difficult times. Last year, Healthwatch England found that people are expected to wait until 2024 for dental appointments, while others are being removed from their practice list. It also found that many were being pressurised into going private. The situation is so bad that Tory MP Bob Seeley, speaking in the House of Commons, called on the UK government to get dentists into England in the next year or two to help with the immediate crisis. The Mirror reported in November that a dozen Tory MPs, including Health Secretary Sajid Javid, benefit from links to private health firms. So, despite Dr Gohani stating today his support for the NHS, his party, at its heart, supports private health care. And this is the core of the issue. If the 2019 prediction of political Nostradamus Jackson Carlow had come true, and Baroness Davidson of London Lynx had become First Minister, the Tories would probably be in the process of privatising parts of Scotland's NHS and its dentists. The Scottish Government, however, is totally committed to dentistry and an NHS free at the point of delivery, a point Marie Todd has strongly emphasised today. Since the SNP came into office, the number of people registered with an NHS dentist has doubled to around 5 million. This can be attributed to record investment in dentistry that provided a 39% increase in the number of high street dentists in Scotland since 2007. There are nearly 56 NHS dentists per 100,000 of the population in Scotland, compared to only 40 per 100,000 in England. Following the May 2021 election, the SNP's first 100 days commitment to deliver NHS free dental care for all, or under 26, has been met, and we are working hard to deliver free dental care for all by the end of this Parliament term. And remember, undergraduate medical and dental students in Scotland study free of charge, unlike in England, where tuition fees introduced by Labour have increased to an eye-watering £9,250 per year. Health spending in Scotland has also increased by 70% since the SNP came to power in 2007, and we abolished prescription fees, which are now £9.35 per item south of the border. As Marie Todd's amendment highlights, the Scottish Government is providing further funding of £20 million for dentistry from February and is increasing the budget for dental services in 2022. Ms Tweed, could I ask you just to pause for a moment, please? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. There is quite a lot of conversation across the, the chamber. I would be pleased if we could hear Ms Tweed. I would just like to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Presiding Officer. By nine percent to a record amount. So, presiding officer, given the UK government is failing to deal with a massive crisis in England, perhaps this Tory motion today should be thanking the Scottish government 
well, the steps it has taken to support dentistry in Scotland, despite it lacking the full fiscal powers of an independent nation. I am confident that the Scottish Government is best placed to make the correct decisions necessary to continue to improve all NHS services in Scotland. It does not need to take lessons from a party that, at its core, Please does conclude, not support Tweed. the NHS. I will be supporting the government amendment this afternoon, Thank and you. the NHS is safe in our hands. Thank, Thank you. you. We now move to winding up speeches, and I call on Paul O'Kane up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, uh, and can I thank Dr Gohani for bringing um, these important issues to the Chamber for debate today. And I think what we have heard today about the state of dentistry in Scotland is deeply concerning, uh, and I think that Jackie Bailey outlined that in her opening uh, very starkly in terms of what she highlighted. Because as we have heard in Scotland, now over 3.5 million NHS dental appointments have been lost through the first lockdown alone, and we have seen 239,000 fewer children and young people accessing dental care than we did two years ago. And in my own region of West Scotland, there have been reports that some people have not been able to see their dentist for 30 months now. And we've heard that um, from colleagues across the chamber as well. Alex Cole Hamilton and others referenced it in their remarks. And indeed, I think something perhaps more fundamental that my colleague Carol Mockin illustrated today is that the decline in access to dentistry is deeply unequal. Uh, and that was, it was echoed uh, in terms of the, the rural issues as well by Finlay Carson, uh, speaking about the inequalities that exist uh, and are particularly acute in rural communities. So whilst the Scottish Government um, sing the praises of their recent changes to access, the implementing of free dental care does not count for much when it is nearly impossible to access appointments in the first place. And it is clear that the current model is not sustainable. And on the current trajectory uh, the government uh, is proceeding with, the situation is only going to get worse. Because NHS dentists started sounding the alarm long ago that we have been heading towards a two-tier system of dental care in Scotland. And the BDA now project that the government's funding model will be the final blow to a sector already struggling so much. Morale within the profession is at an all-time low, with over a third of dentists stating that they will leave the profession altogether in the next 12 months should the Minister's current funding model go ahead. And without an immediate and comprehensive support plan in place, the Government risks the collapse of NHS dentistry in Scotland becoming their legacy. It is on that basis that we implore them to listen to the professionals and to rethink the current position and the wider implications for people across Scotland. And the Minister must surely know by now that these issues have persisted for years and that COVID cannot explain all of the issues away. When we have more and more people turning to and accessing private dental care, we know that NHS dentistry is not collapsing due to the level of aerosol generating procedures, but rather because it needs a fundamental overhaul uh, of services to stop privatisation through the back door. So to only cite COVID, I think undermines the hard work that NHS dentists have put in to mitigate uh, years of problems and underfunding. Presiding officer, I do want to support and welcome today uh, the commitment of the Scottish Government to further expand the Child Smile Scheme. We on these benches are proud that the actions made by the last Scottish Labour Government in Scotland will continue to benefit all Scots. What Scottish Labour's amendment does acknowledge is the very real concerns that colleagues have raised across the Chamber today. These are the concerns of our constituents and of professionals in the dental sector. Acknowledging the scale of the inequality that now exists is part of the steps that need to be taken before the government can even begin to think about tackling them. Presiding officer, it is clear that what we need to see from this government is a sense of urgency to begin to truly make access to dentistry equal to all people, not just those who can afford to go private or those who live in urban communities. Scottish Labour know that in order to fix the system in Scotland, a comprehensive overhaul is required. But we know that for some reason this government seems unwilling or incapable to right the issues in NHS dentistry that we have seen laid bare throughout the debate today. It is clear that the people of Scotland deserve so much better than what is currently being offered, and so do our dentists, and I support the motion in Jackie Bailey's name. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Hamza Youssef. Up to five minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking our hard-working dentists, but also all those that are involved in the dental sector. I know 
there has been a lot of attention paid in this debate, rightly to dentists, but of course uh, dental nurses, uh, dental uh, technicians, uh, receptionists, and all of those that are involved in the dental sector. My thanks goes to every single one of them. And I am not just saying that because four of my cousins are dentists themselves. Um, any uh, suggestion that we have not provided financial support, I am afraid, to dentistry during the pandemic, I think, is incorrect. So a number of uh, contributions from the opposition uh, have suggested that we have not provided I am not talking about you, Ms Bailey, don't worry. But others uh, have suggested <laughs> others have suggested that we have not uh, provided substantial funding. I disagree. Uh, twenty million pounds of additional money from this month, fifty million pounds for financial support. I will in a second. Fifty million for financial support for dental practice, thirty five million for additional PPE, seven point five million pounds for dentist uh, drills, uh, which will help of course uh, with those aerosol generating procedures and five million pounds for ventilation. I'm happy I'm happy I, I promised first to Dr. Gohani, I'll give him uh, Sandish Gohani. Thank the Cabinet Secretary. The twenty million that was announced in February was not discussed with the BDA. Uh, the Scottish Government have not explained their methodology as to how the sum was cons uh, calculated. No consultation, no transparency. Would the Minister show his workings, please? Cabinet no, I, I just completely disagree uh, with the suggestion that the BDA do not welcome additional funding to the sector. Of course they do. But what I would say to Dr Gohan, and this goes to the root of his amendment, is he called the emergency payments flawed. I disagree with that characterisation. But then is asking us to continue them for the next financial year, at a time, of course, when his party often tell us that the pandemic itself is over. Again, an assertion I tend to disagree with. So what we are doing, the funding that we are going to uh, announce, and, and we are still in those discussions with the BDA, will be to link financial reward uh, with activity so that more patients can be seen. I don't have much time, but of course I will give Ms Bailey. I, I genuinely think, with all the greatest respect, that you are arguing about the wrong thing. The issue is the outdated model of funding, um, and I would desperately encourage you to actually reform that. So it's not about volume, it's about prevention. I, 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 I will come to that. Uh, I don't actually uh, necessarily disagree wholly with uh, Ms Bailey, she'll be pleased to hear, that I'm not suggesting that there is no room or no place for reform. I, I've never said that. In fact, in my discussions with the BDA, I've often said I understand their desire for reform. What I am saying is when we have the level of backlog that has been undoubtedly exacerbated by the last two years and the impact that uh, IPC controls have had, infection prevention controls have had, uh, on dentistry, then the immediate priority has to be to work through that backlog. And yes, let's talk about root and branch reform uh, of the sector. But what we can't do is have a protracted discussion about reform. And in the meantime, patients are still waiting to be seen. Uh, let me also take issue with, let me just take issue, no, I won't, because I, I only have two minutes. Let me take uh, issue with suggestions, uh, and I think sensationalist suggestions, that the NHS dentistry was on the brink of collapse and that, and that uh, somehow there was not any progress being made uh, pre-COVID. That is absolutely unfair and the statistics do not bear that out. P7 pupils, pre-pandemic, P7 pupils with no decay increased from 64% in 2009 to 80% under this government. P1 pupils, 58% to 74% in 2020. No, I won't take an intervention. 5.2 million people registered with an NHS dentist in 2019 compared to 2.6 million in 2007 when Labour were last in power. So our record on dentistry uh, and supporting dentists uh, is, uh, it stands uh, on its own. Uh, and, is, and I think anybody who is fair-minded in this would see that there has been progress and improvement uh, in, in the oral health of the country. Where there has not been improvement, where there is still a need for progress, then again, our model of linking activity, uh, financial reward to activity, is absolutely the right uh, way to go. Uh, we recognise that uncertainty does presently exist amongst NHS dental teams. I think that's a fair uh, comment for the opposition to make. But that is why we're not suggesting a cliff edge. We're ensuring a soft transition uh, as we fully uh, recover the sector. In the meantime, I go back to this point, on the 1st of April, uh, before the 1st of April, in the next month, being able to announce a package that I hope will incentivise uh, the dental, uh, uh, dentists and, and, and dental practices to see more patients. Uh, this point about upselling was mentioned by a number of members, and I will conclude on this point, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I, am in, I have as much dismay as any other member uh, about the practice of up 
uh, selling private plans uh, to the public. And I raised this issue with the General Dental Council. And let me say to any member, uh, and indeed any uh, dentist and dental practice uh, watching, that if there are, uh, if, if members hear cases of dentists upselling private plans, then please report that to your NHS board, because that is not allowed under the NHS regulations. And let me conclude, I, I Presiding Officer, to... by saying uh, that this government is proud of the record that we have uh, in improving the dental uh, oral health of this country. And as we get out of this pandemic, uh, we will support that sector. Uh, and I look forward uh, to, to, to uh, supporting the sector. But Thank I you, Cabinet motion Secretary. In Todd's name. Thank you. I now call on Sue Webber to wind up the debate. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today we have heard that the, under the SNP, NHS dentistry is in crisis. Covid support is set to be withdrawn in two months' time, while even before the pandemic, the SNP were letting down NHS patients with their conveyor belt approach to dentistry. Morale in the profession is at an all-time low, with more than a third of dentists saying they intend to leave the profession in the next 12 months. One of my constituents in Edinburgh spoke to their dentist yesterday who said they feel that they have been abandoned during the pandemic. And the dentists tuning in to this this afternoon have messaged me to say they are quite concerned and rightly furious with some of the comments from the government today. Yeah. Failure to act risks sparking an exodus from the workforce that will leave families across Scotland losing access to NHS dentistry for good. We, the Scottish Conservatives, acknowledge these concerns expressed by many in the profession and call upon the Scottish Government to come forward with a plan for ensuring the long-term sustainability of NHS dentistry. As Jackie Bailey rightly stated, the complacency shown today by the Scottish Government should be alarm to us all. Over 3.5 million NHS dental appointments were lost in Scotland because of the pandemic, and this unprecedented backlog continues to grow. It will take years to clear. And despite their best efforts to restore patient care, Dental practices continue to operate considerably below pre-COVID levels. Attendance rates have plummeted during the pandemic due to restrictions imposed on dental practices. Just over a half of registered patients saw an NHS dentist in the last two years. And this equates to over 850,000 fewer patients being seen by their NHS dentist compared to pre-pandemic levels. Dental inequalities are widening and the participation gap between the least and most deprived communities is getting dramatically. Yes. Minister. I thank the member for taking an intervention. We all acknowledge that there is a challenge in recovering the dental sector over in, in the entirety of the UK um, and ensuring that the capacity increases and that more patients are seen. Does the member agree with the Tory um, approach in England of penalising um, NHS dentists, or does the member agree with our approach of providing additional funding? Would she please clarify? Sue Webber. I, like the, the minister, has been elected to the Scottish Parliament, and I will be standing here today talking about Scottish issues. How can dentists, according to, as Gillian Mackay said earlier, how can dentists assess clinical need for their patients if the patients can't even get an appointment to see them. And as Brian Whittle highlighted, the, de the health inequalities fa faced by our young people are awful. There's been a sharp increase in children having full extractions, and it should shock every one of us in this chamber that some children in Scotland today do not even own a toothbrush. Child dental health is going backwards. The SNP Government must do more to help facilitate routine NHS dental care. And as my colleague Dr Sandesh Gohani said, the Scottish Government emergency funding package for NHS dentistry that was introduced at the start of the pandemic was not fit for purpose, but it was better than nothing. Yet from the 1st of April, this SNP Government will cut this emergency funding whilst leaving all the inf uh, infection control measures in place. Not at this stage, Mr Doris, thank you. Dentists are usually paid based on each individual item of treatment. However, during the pandemic, this funding mechanism has been superseded by the top-up financial support, which recognised the additional infection control measures that severely reduced the number of patients that could be seen. The SNP isn't planning, the government is not planning to reduce or remove these measures, despite withdrawing the financial support. 
and we believe that the emergency COVID support cannot be withdrawn whilst the strict infection control guidance remains in place. Top-up funding must be maintained for the upcoming financial year while you decide on your long-term plan for the future. The British Dental Association has warned that for the government's plan to end COVID support payments from April, it will devastate dental services across the country. My colleague Finlay Carson also highlighted the stark inequalities faced by families across rural Scotland and rightly reinforces the negative impact the funding removal will have on the 1st of April. The move means the income of NHS dentists will be decimated. As many have stressed, it will make their position financially unviable. NHS dentistry in Scotland was in crisis before COVID hit, let's not forget. For too long now, people have gone without access to full NHS dental services. To tackle this unprecedented challenge, dental practices need support from the Scottish Government. We are calling on the SNP Government to work with dentists to prevent the collapse of NHS dentistry. It doesn't matter if the treatment or enhanced examinations are free at the point of need if people can't get an appointment. The Cabinet Secretary must get a grip of the situation and bring forward a credible plan to restore routine dental care and tackle the enormous backlog. The SNP will always put independence obsession ahead of national interests. The Scottish Conservatives, Scotland's real alternative, are pushing for the full return of routine services and putting the people of Scotland first. Thank you. That concludes the debate on preventing the collapse of NHS dentistry in Scotland. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, before which there will be a brief pause. <laughs>